This talk is called The Monarch's Egg and Other Everyday Wonders with a focus on the butterflies of Louisiana. This is actually not my original talk. This is a talk that at one point in time was given lovingly by the Cliftons, Walter and Olga, who are pictured here, and they are neighbors of mine in the town of Abita Springs. Walter was an avid naturalist. He spent a lot of time with me in the Honey Island Swamp. We did a lot of nest searching, and, um, and he took a lot of really incredible photographs. He did not do digital photography. Everything is film photography. And he used to say um, he was perfectly satisfied with a $300 camera body and a $1,400 lens. <laughs> so that's what he invested in. And um, yeah, so these photographs were uh, sort of taken the original and I would say much more challenging way. I am Dr. Donata Henry. I'm a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Tulane University. And my area of expertise is actually birds and specifically understory breeding birds in bottomland hardwood forests and local forests in southeast Louisiana. But tonight I'm going to talk to you about hummingbirds. I mean, <laughs> I'd love to come back and talk to you about hummingbirds, about butterflies. Um, the reason I'm thinking about hummingbirds is because I was going to suggest that you grab your favorite nectar, relax, and you're welcome to come in and out of this show like a butterfly, like a hummingbird. Just enjoy it. Uh, it's a lot of beautiful images, and it will be as if we're taking a bit of a virtual walk uh, through a garden and enjoying really amazing and unique images of butterflies unlike anything you've ever seen. To illustrate that point, I bet you've never seen the egg of a monarch butterfly, which is what is pictured here on this first slide. So, like I said, get comfortable and let's go. So before we really dive into Walter's photography, I want to just answer a few questions about butterflies because I know there's certain things that can be on people's minds. And, um, and so the first of those sometimes is, can you handle butterflies? So just really quickly, because I have this picture of my son Ben here, we'd had this black swallowtail fly into our house and he was able to very gently and delicately pick it up He's holding it by its hind wings and he was able to get it safely out of the house. It's a good idea in general not to pick up and touch butterflies. It does, it can damage the scales on their wings and that affects uh, the coloration and intensity of the wing and their sexual selection. So, um, so in general, you don't want to handle butterflies, but if you need to handle a butterfly, for example, to get it out of your house, firmly holding it by the hind wings as close to the body as possible and just, you know, moving it along quickly and safely is, uh, is an okay thing to do. So here's Ben holding a butterfly. Oops, somebody just annotated my slide. <laughs> I'm going to clear that away. So, uh, so yeah, so there's the butterfly. And I wanted to share, also getting started here, I wanted to share this poem with you, although my slide advancer is now not working. <laughs> Hold on. Okay, so this is a poem uh, that I like to get started with, again, to kind of bring you into a space of relaxation and appreciation of these amazing animals. It's called Butterflies, and here it is. There will be butterflies, there will be summer skies, and flowers upthrust, when all that Caesar bids and all the pyramids are dust. There will be gaudy wings over the bones of things, and never grief. Who says that summer skies who says that butterflies are brief. So let's get started. One thing we have to get uh, straight before we really dive into appreciating the life cycles of butterflies is what it is and what it isn't. So when you think about uh, how insects grow up, you know, people grow up uh, through, um, you know, a kind of a, a slow process. It takes a long time developmentally for us to to get big, uh, and insects have to grow up too. So an insect like a grasshopper is hatched out of an egg, and then it goes through what are called these successive instars, and so it molts into successful, su successively larger stages um, by basically shedding its skin and getting bigger. And a little grasshopper looks a lot like the big grasshopper that it's gonna become, and this is called incomplete metamorphosis. By the way, if you have questions for me as we go along, you can, you're welcome to type them into the chat and we'll have time at the end to answer questions. So 
<clears throat> Similarly, but a little bit uh, unusually by comparison is the, uh, the life cycle of a dragonfly. So here you can see an adult laying eggs and then you can see the nymph stage, which interestingly is aquatic. Uh, so they actually live in these two different places in their life cycle. And then finally, you can have what's referred to as that, that final instar, that last molt that they undergo. And that's when the adult emerges. And that is also incomplete metamorphosis. Now, we know that butterflies and moths do something different. So what they do is referred to as complete metamorphosis and they start off as caterpillars. So these are some caterpillars that I raised um, over at my house. And in this case, they actually did not construct a chrysalis, they constructed a, co a cocoon. And if we were in uh, a space right now together, I would love to ask you guys what it is that builds a cocoon. But I suspect that most of you know uh, that what builds a cocoon in this case is a moth and quite beautiful moth. So uh, when it comes to moths, they are uh, very much like butterflies, but they don't always get as much credit for their beauty. And I would say that in this case, this polyphemus moth is in fact uh, really beautiful. So I just wanted to share it with you because I was quite proud of this moth. And this is one photograph that I got that I was like, wow, these, these things just can't be beat. This is the polyphemus moth demonstrating complete metamorphosis. So um, another, uh, this is my husband, Renee, and in this picture, he is holding a, a fairly common moth on the North Shore, but one that's also well-loved, and this is, I know many of you know the name of this moth, this is a Luna moth. Um, one of their favorite host plants around here, although they will feed on a variety of trees, are sweet gum. And I just, I love this photograph uh, that I was able to get of this Luna moth, where you get a really nice look at that just crazy hairy body, those great hairy legs, and these really neat antennae. These antennae can, um, pick up pheromones or chemical signals from the females to help them find uh, their mate. And interestingly with Luna moths, they really don't feed as adults. So they, uh, you can see in this picture even that there's not really any kind of, um, they don't really have um, mouth parts. They really don't even have much of a digestive tract because they're just, they're not feeding as adults. So this, these are the moths. So this is the Luna moth. Walter also got this picture and I know it's kind of fuzzy, it's, but it's fuzzy, in its fuzziness, I actually really appreciate it because um, these moths always look fuzzy to me. And actually, they often get mistaken for not being moths. I know, Jennifer, you must have been asked about this particular one before. People will often say, what is that teeny tiny little bird that's in my garden? It looks like a hummingbird, but it's even maybe a little smaller. And uh, it's this amazing member of the sphinx moth family, often referred to as a hummingbird clear wing. And in this uh, picture, it's feeding on a cigar plant. When uh, students will ask me about this, you know, that they think they've seen a bird, and I just have to remind them that birds do not have antennae, nor do they have six legs. But, uh, you know, otherwise, yeah, it looks pretty similar. So you might see these in your yard. I see them in my mother's yard in New Orleans around uh, ginger plants a lot. They really like the ginger. All right. So right off the bat and sort of tagging on after uh, Wendy's talk from the, uh, the last Orleans Audubon uh, gathering that we had, I wanted to talk about milkweed. I feel like there's a little bit of a touchy subject, and I know that there are likely some experts in the crowd, and I just wanted to share a little bit of information with you about milkweed. So let's talk. What I've listed here um, are many of the species in Louisiana. The, the group Asclepius, the genus, is, is really diverse, and there's many different species across North America. And in the southeastern United States, and specifically in Louisiana, all of these species occur. These are all um, mostly native species in the state, and you can read more about them. I love Char Charles Allen's books, um, and the Louisiana Wildflower Guide has some short descriptions of all these species. Um, they really vary in terms of where they grow, where you can find them. Some of them are, you know, in, in northern Louisiana. Some of them are in pine flatwoods. Some of them are in much, you know, wet, wet swamps. They grow in different places, but by and large, what I have found with native milkweeds is that they, um, they're sparse. They're often sparse. So they'll grow one or two stems. They grow in a small patch, but you don't get like a field of these milkweeds, at least not where I am on the North Shore. They're pretty patchily distributed. Um, I did just want to mention that if you're interested in purchasing 
native milkweeds. You, Linda Ald uh, checked her website today and she has the aquatic milkweed, so Asclepius perennis, the one I put in yellow down here, is one of the milkweeds that is currently available at, um, at her store on Jefferson Highway. It's called, uh, well, it's called Barber Laboratories, but she might have another name <laughs> for it as well. Anyway, Linda Ald is a great resource uh, for information about milkweed. But I feel like what we really need to talk about is tropical milkweed. I have a confession to make. If it means you're going to turn off this talk and not listen to me anymore, then I apologize. <laughs> and I understand. And I forgive you. <laughs> but, I, but hear me out. So I know there's a question about tropical milkweed whether you should grow or not grow, have it in your yard or not. I know that there is a, a group of you that are really passionate about native plants, and I love that. I think that is just, that's ultimately an excellent goal and, and the best way to cultivate a really uh, friendly wildlife garden. However, I do think that there's a little bit of misconception about tropical milkweed, and all I want to put out there is Research is still ongoing, right? So we really shouldn't slam the door on the species, and here's why. So <clears throat> one point I want to make, let me back up a little bit, cons. Okay, so the tropical milkweed is not native. Um, it can get a buildup of this OE disease. I'm not actually going to try to pronounce that. That is an acronym for the scientific name, which is very long and complicated, and I would butcher it. But essentially, this is a protozoan parasite and they can, uh, they can be quite numerous on the bodies of adult butter butterflies, and they can be transmitted from plant to plant by the butterflies. So there's a concern that as butterflies visit milkweed plants, um, specifically like the monarchs, visit milkweed plants, they can transmit the disease from plant to plant. So you could have a buildup of OE disease, and you could also have tropical milkweeds due to their growing season interfere with uh, migration. And so those are concerns about this plant, and those I think would probably be some of the ones that would might deter you from growing this plant. However, I do want to make a few points. One thing is, this plant is very easy to cultivate and it creates a high biomass, so it provides a lot of food for monarchs. Uh, it does attract pollinators of all kinds. It is actually in fact nutritious. So for the monarchs, research that's being done at Tulane University shows that the caterpillars feeding on it grow into, um, grow into, and males particularly, grow into large adults. Um, they grow fairly quickly. They have like a very, they have a good productive growth rate when they're eating tropical milkweed. Um, females seem to have a preference for ovipositing on tropical milkweed. It's interesting. And there also seem to be some self-medicative properties. So tropical milkweed, like the other milkweeds, does have um, chemical compounds that provide some, um, that provide a defense to monarchs, and they, they, uh, they use that as part of a, a anti-predatory defense. But there's also some self-medicative defense against the OE disease that's, been, uh, that's being researched at Tulane right now. So <clears throat> there's a few things to think about here. First of all, the argument about buildup of OE disease, this could happen on any milkweed. It's not unique to tropical milkweed. That's any milkweed that's visited by monarchs could get the transmission of the parasite. The interference with migration is probably the bigger issue for this species because we're lucky that in New Orleans and even on the North Shore, we have pretty long growing seasons and so the plant can last for a long time. But the point I want to make about that is um, there's an easy solution. Just cut it back. So right now, if, um, if you want to help monarchs, because they do suffer from habitat destruction and loss of forage, that's like one of their biggest problems uh, that the populations face, then you need to own up to the idea that monarchs need milkweed. This is a really important uh, host plant for the species. And if you want to cultivate that native milkweed and put some of that out there, that's fantastic. But if you want to get the tropical milkweed out there too, they will use it and it's not bad for them. And what you need to do is periodically just cut it back. Cutting it back does two things. One, it helps to lessen that the parasite load that could accumulate if butterflies are using it a lot. And then in the fall, it also uh, will curtail any problems with interference with their, uh, their migration and their diapause during migration. So, um, so if you kind of manage it well, it's, it's really at this point not believed to be uh, problematic to use that tropical milkweed. But hopefully I don't lose you there. Okay, <laughs> moving on, because I feel like that was an important point. So here we are looking at the monarch's egg on a milkweed leaf. And I want you to appreciate how tiny this egg is. These are little hairs of the milkweed leaf. 
This is the, the diameter of the leaf, and you can see that, uh, in contrast, the egg is not much thicker than the diameter of that milkweed leaf. It's really quite impressive that Walter was able to, to see this in the first place and capture this photograph. Here's the caterpillar, which I know you all are familiar with. So uh, the caterpillar of the uh, monarch has this nice, what we call aposomatic coloration. So the black and yellow and white uh, provides a warning to predators. It's understood that birds that kind of have their first encounter with a monarch figure out pretty easily and quickly that it's distasteful and then they'll avoid them in the future. My favorite attribute of the monarch, of course, is this beautiful chrysalis that is this intense jade color with these gold spots. It's absolutely one of the most beautiful phenomena in nature. And I wanted to show you, this was uh, a chrysalis that was in my yard that I was able to capture, honestly, y'all, just with my cell phone. <laughs> but here is a, a monarch chrysalis, and I simply wanted to show you how neat it is, and maybe some of y'all have seen this before, maybe all of you have seen this before, when right before eclosion uh, and the butterfly emerging, you have the chrysalis becomes quite clear, and you can see the, the, you can see the adult butterfly on the inside, which is really quite amazing. And then I liked showing just how that chitinous uh, chrysalis looks after the butterfly has merged. And this is another photograph from my yard. So this butterfly, it takes a few hours, you know, so if you see a butterfly emerge from a chrysalis and you notice that it's got kind of wet wings and it's not flying, I think, so. I've, I know sometimes people have communicated to me they're concerned, right? Oh, the wings look, the wings look really small and crumpled up which butterflies can get stuff like that. However, ideally, the, they start to expand and, and lengthen, and as they dry out, they achieve the size and the shape that you're accustomed to seeing. So if you just leave them alone in a safe space, they'll be fine. Um, so this one, uh, really beautiful. Again, I was able to capture this photograph, and I love that these guys are referred to as the brush-footed or the four-footed butterflies. This is just a, a large family of butterflies that include the monarchs. And in this photograph, it's so neat that somehow I was able to capture this blue light on their toes as if they had these little blue hairs. And I really don't know very much of this about this. I don't know if it's simply a trick of the light or, uh, or some feature on the legs of this butterfly, but I had never seen that quite like it before. Perhaps it's just reflection. Anyway, it was neat to capture this on a very um, recently emerged monarch. I also wanted to point out a cool thing about monarchs that uh, I know many of you all probably know, which is that you can tell the males and the females apart from each other. So on this monarch, if again, if we were in the room, I would ask you to shout out your thoughts. So maybe you can just shout them out to the Zoom world. But uh, in this case, we are in fact looking at what? A male or a female? There's an easy clue. So they have these uh, what are called adraconal scales. And the males have these scales, these dark spots here, which in some species um, can actually apparently are receptors for pheromones. Um, it's actually not thought that that's how they're used in monarchs, uh, but it does distinguish them. It is a little bit of sexual dimorphism in the species. All right, so we just started off with one of the most, I would say, well-known and popular species of butterflies in Louisiana, but now we're going to move into some that may not be as familiar or uh, as common to you, so this will be neat to explore some others. One of the butterflies that is similar looking to the monarch is, is pictured here. It's called the queen, and they are in the same genus as the monarch. And as you can see, they also feed on milkweeds and this, the caterpillars are similar looking. Uh, they have a little bit more red to them, but you can see here them munching away. Here's some aphids, this might be a little baby uh, coming along recently hatched. When butterflies are, when caterpillars are preparing to pupate, they go into what's referred to as the J stage. So if you ever see a caterpillar hanging around like that, hanging from its kind of tail end with its head curled up, um, it is, really preparing to leave the caterpillar stage. And, um, and you can see here that the chrysalis of the queen is actually very similar to that monarch. And I love that Walter, Walter captured this photograph where there's a little baby caterpillar up on the top of this leaf. I don't know if y'all can see it, it's right up here. Um, and it's next door to its, uh, to its big brother uh, that has a few stages ahead of it here and has uh, gone into its chrysalis stage the pupa. All right, and then, um, and then here we have the adult, and you can see that when you look at the wings this way, uh, you can, it looks a lot like the monarch. So the underwings look a lot like a monarch than the upper wings do. All right. Um, 
Okay, and again, oh, and you can see those scales again here. So those, uh, those hadraconial scales that are characteristic of the males. Okay, here's another one that you may recognize. It's actually not as closely related to the monarch as that queen is that I just showed you, but this is the viceroy. And these butterflies um, can be told apart from monarchs because they have this black band that intersects the orange on the wings. So you could see a butterfly, you could think monarch, but you better look twice because it could be the queen or it could be a viceroy. There's a lot of mimicry in butterflies. We'll talk about that some more in a minute. Their host plants are black willows. Um, and where do black willows grow? They grow by the Mississippi River. They grow on the levees. This is a plant of wet environments. So uh, that's where these these butterflies uh, like to hang out. Here are the eggs. So the viceroy, interestingly, has eggs that are really different looking from that monarch. Um, the viceroy's eggs look like little um, beaded jewels. I mean, it would be so neat to have a pair of earrings like this. Um, super tiny on the tip of this leaf. And by contrast, you probably would not want to have jewelry that looked like this. This caterpillar is using a strategy where it's got um, spines that would make it not so palatable to swallow and it's got a coloration that frankly looks like bird poop so if you look like bird poop then there's not so much that's interested in eating you and this is a strategy of the viceroy butterfly which is really quite different from um from the monarch's caterpillar not only is the caterpillar looking like bird poop, but the chrysalis is also looking like bird poop. I think if you saw this on a stem, you probably, uh, you'd probably just think it was bird poop dripping off the stem. So great strategy for avoiding predation. And I mean, look at the level of bird poop detail. We can see nitrogenous waste here. We can see solid waste. And then, you know, the, uh, the uric acid, it's a beautiful thing. Amazingly done. And here is the adult viceroy. Okay, moving on to some other, um, another group of common uh, swallowtails in our area and butterflies that mimic each other. So just keep in mind who's looking like who in this talk and then we'll get around to kind of summing it up in a minute. But this is one that's uh, pretty large, very large. It's known as the Palamedes swallowtail. And the Palamedes likes uh, a variety of laurels and uh, sweet bay. So the sweet bay magnolia is a host plant, for example. And this caterpillar actually uses a different, a very different strategy. So in this case, the caterpillar is mimicking a snake. So something that would be uh, a bit fearsome to a bird or a lizard predator. These eye spots are fakes. So the actual eyes of the caterpillar are located way down here. And, um, and this is just a, a type of uh, mimicry so that they can look scary. So hopefully you're feeling scared right now of this Palamedes caterpillar. The chrysalis is one of my favorites. It is incredibly well camouflaged on the twig or stem that it builds. And sometimes these chrysalids can be different colors. So like this one is on a brown stem and is brown. Sometimes if it's on a greener stem, it seems like the caterpillars are doing some uh, color matching, which is, uh, seems very sophisticated. And I also just wanted to point out the way it has used a little bit of silk here to make two strands that hold it up like a hammock. And it is also mimicking the pattern and texture of the twig that it is on so that it just goes completely unnoticed. It's incredible camouflage. And I also wanted to point out these little pores right here along the side, these little, basically these little spiracles they're called. That's a place where gas exchange can occur. So it's essentially how the growing and changing organism inside can breathe. All right, so there's the adult Palamedes on some liatris. This is a spicebush swallowtail, very similar looking swallowtail. And this one, uh, its host plant is a spicebush. Here's the egg, very simple little egg here deposited. And you'll notice that the butterflies are not depositing like large clumps of eggs all close to each other. You might see one or two eggs or a little smattering of eggs, but they really do seem to be strategic in terms of placing the eggs in such a way that um, caterpillars are not competing with each other so intensively. Now, I've certainly had that happen with monarchs on milkweed before where, you know, there's a lot of caterpillars and they're feeding pretty voraciously, but in general, uh, it seems like they try to spread those eggs out. The spicebus swallowtail also has this impressive snake-like looking caterpillar, really beautiful, intense coloration, and look at these blue spots. I mean, if I could have blue spots like that, bring it on, gorgeous. 
And I love those eye spots. Um, interestingly, as they get closer to building their chrysalis, they turn, they often turn orange. So this, this uh, coloration change is indicative of maturation and growth prior to building the chrysalis. And here you can see that this butterfly's chrysalis really mimics uh, a leaf, kind of uh, a dead leaf hanging off of this stem. Again, something that not many things would uh, mess around with. Okay, and here's the adult spice bush. Here's another large swallowtail. This is uh, named the giant swallowtail, appropriately. And these guys' host plant is citrus. So I get people asking me a lot, like, oh, I have these weird caterpillars on my citrus, you know, should I squash them? What do I do? Generally, with these butterflies that lay eggs um, on trees, I mean, they're, they're, it's not, they're not going to wreak damage on these trees uh, in such a way that you really need to worry about your crop, per se. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but they might not make it look so good, uh, because this is another one that uh, does this amazing strategy of mimicking poop. So uh, in this case, this is a student of mine. We went on a field trip to Honey Island Swamp, and so we decided to go ahead and demonstrate this is actual real bird poop, okay, just so you didn't feel confused about that. And then here is the caterpillar uh, that was on this citrus tree in Honey Island Swamp. So this is the, uh, the bird poop mimicking caterpillar. You can tell this is one of my favorite strategies in the animal world. And here is the giant swallowtail grown up a bit. And again, you can see this amazing strategy of looking like bird poop. But look, it's like it's not enough, right? So in addition to that strategy, it's also got the kind of snake-like head, just in case, you know, <laughs> the bird poop wasn't enough. And it has this really neat behavior that several caterpillars do of emitting these structures on top of their head. They're called osmenteria. And what this does is it emits chemical odors that also repel uh, predators. So multiple strategies here, um, visual strategies, olfactory strategies to deter predators. And this is the chrysalis, another one of my favorites where it's really looking like the snag of a twig. It's got parts that look like lichen. Uh, you can see the little spiracles here used for breathing gas exchange. And again, using that little sort of hammock to hold it up. And here's the giant swallowtail newly emerged. You can see that the underwings are actually pr quite brightly colored, much more brightly colored or, uh, than the wings seen from above, which you can see here, uh, which are much darker. Here's one of my favorite stories. Okay, so one time I had my hummingbird feeder out and I was having pretty good action on the hummingbird feeder, especially by this one particular male ruby throat. He was fairly aggressive and, you know, protecting this feeder. Well, this giant swallowtail butterfly comes loping along and it's just doing its thing like butterflies do, especially when they're big and kind of lazy. And he's just kind of, you know, swoops down on this feeder and he starts feeding and the hummingbird is having a fit and the hummingbird is like chasing the butterfly and poking at it and just trying to deter it as best it can from feeding on the feeder and the, and the butterfly just couldn't care less. It just kept feeding away perfectly happily, completely ignoring the hummingbird. Um, so it's pretty amazing when the butterfly basically gets the upper hand. But that happened here at my house in Abita. I love it. All right. Um, so this is the black swallowtail. This one is another one that looks pretty similar to what I've just shown you, but has a completely different host plant. So if you've ever had cilantro, parsley, dill, anything in that family growing and it gets covered by these beautiful caterpillars, look, here's my advice. Go buy some more, share it with the butterflies, right? So, you know, if you're a little bit aggravated that you had your herb garden growing, and then you have this incredible butterfly show up, just, you know, make more. That's my solution. Um, because they do in fact need this plant to grow and thrive. Here's the beautiful caterpillar. Here's the amazing chrysalis. This one has used a strategy of, uh, of being green and actually having even some yellow tint to mimic uh, this plant that it's growing on, quite beautiful. And here's the adult. So look, that's got to be worth at least a few dill plants, right, to have these beautiful butterflies in your yard. Uh, I'm sure y'all have stories about this, about your invasions by black swallowtails. Uh, <clears throat> and I apologize on their behalf, but they do need to eat. I did want to point out uh, that this is the male. 
black swallowtail, and the female is uh, a little bit less intensely colored with this spotting. This is uh, an interesting one because it looks a lot like those swallowtails in its coloration, but you'll notice it doesn't have the swallowtail. So this is the red spotted purple. This butterfly is, uh, feeds on black cherry. That's one of its favorite uh, host plants. I'm sorry, the caterpillar feeds on black cherry. And here's the egg. The egg shape and construction actually reminds me a lot of that uh, Viceroy, uh, where it's got like little, almost like little pearls all clustered together on the tip of this leaf. And it's another one that is resorting to poop-like strategies for avoiding predation, just all around nasty to eat. And here's uh, the adult where you can see the underwing and you can see those really beautiful patterns on that wing. I had a, a experience when I was doing field work studying Swainson's warblers where I had parked, it was a very, very hot day. It was the middle of the summer and I was driving a little red pickup truck and I was sweating a lot. And I don't really sweat a lot, but you know, come August, I started sweating. So I was sweating a lot. My truck, you know, had, didn't have air conditioning. And I had gone out to do field work. And when I came back to my truck, I had left my windows unrolled and my truck was full of hundreds of red spotted purple butterflies that had come in to lick the salt off the seat of my truck from my sweat. So uh, butterflies do need, uh, you know, the, the nectar that they get from flowers is a really important part of their diet, but they also seek out minerals. And uh, that was one of those cases where uh, they were enjoying my minerals. So I did also want to share with you kind of the story between these, uh, these particular butterflies that can be tricky to ID in the field because they look so darn similar to each other. So like I was just talking about that red spotted purple, here's that black swallowtail that I'd mentioned. If it folded its wings up, you'd see that really beautiful yellow, but in here you just see the, the black. And then um, yellow stripes and some spots down there. Oh, and then the giant also has the yellow when it folds its wing up, but more completely yellow. And then here's the spicebush swallowtail. And all these butterflies are actually mimicking this species here, which is the pipe vine swallowtail. So this is the most toxic of the group. And these guys are actually not toxic or not as toxic, but they're acting as mimics. So it's a type of, um, it's a type of Batesian mimicry where these species are actually more edible than they look, but they're taking advantage of the fear factor that's created by the very toxic uh, pipe vine swallowtail. So really interesting uh, instances of mimicry across butterflies. The, the group as a whole has a lot of this uh, that occurs, this type of mimicry that I'm talking about. Um, and this is a particularly interesting example in our area because we have all of these butterflies. Another really beautiful one that's been more common in my yard this year uh, than usual, I would say. This is the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail, another really beautiful large swallowtail. I don't actually have a lot of pictures of this one, but I did just want to point out that uh, Walter was able to capture quite nicely the, this female here. So here's a female Eastern Tiger, and then here is the male. I'll go back so you can see. Here's the female, so you can see more blue, a little bit of red right here. They have just a little bit of more coloration. Um, and then here's the male. And they feed on tulip poplar. So this is a tree uh, relative. It's in the uh, magnolia family. And the tulip poplars, uh, we have one on Tulane's campus. I'm afraid it's about <laughs> to uh, become the victim of a construction project. But, uh, but anyway, this tree is actually the largest species of tree east of the Mississippi River. They get to be quite tall and majestic. They have really long, uh, strong trunks and uh, gain incredible height and then have these pretty diminutive little teacup flowers. Uh, quite beautiful. And this is actually not Walter's photograph. He didn't have a photograph, uh, or at least I didn't get one uh, with him from the tiger swallowtail, but this is what the caterpillar looks like. It's another one of the snake uh, mimics. Okay, we're almost there, guys. You doing okay? Everybody, I hope we're getting some thumbs up out there. Everybody's uh, staying with me or at least kind of wandering, flitting in and out happily. Um, hope you guys are doing okay and enjoying this picture of uh, a really beautiful butterfly that I rarely ever see, but it is here. It's local. It's called the zebra swallowtail. Um, in this photo, you can see that one of the, uh, the little trains on the tail there has, uh, has uh, been worn off. Uh, here's another beautiful shot of a zebra swallowtail, and it feeds on my husband's favorite plant, which is the pawpaw. So the pawpaw, what's the deal with the pawpaw? It's the only native fruit. 
Oh no, anyway, okay, he claims to be the expert. But the pawpaw is, uh, makes this really interesting, strange, custardy-like fruit. Uh, where I am in Louisiana, it doesn't really set fruit uh, to the it's extent large. that it would. The largest fruit in North America, but as you go a little bit further north, uh, there's there's actually festivals around this tree, the pawpaw, and it is the host plant and is native, and it is the host plant for the zebra swallowtail. Here's the zebra swallowtail's uh, caterpillar, and you can see it's growing older and getting some more of that interesting stripy coloration, a little bit of warning signal there, and here is the very incredibly leaf-like chrysalis, and again you can see the little pores for gas exchange here. Uh, there's another beautiful shot of the zebra swallowtail on some uh, tifonia. And then this one is, uh, you've probably encountered before, so this is referred to as the common buckeye. Uh, these I often spot in the, um, like in the Abita Flatwoods, but uh, yeah, so not an uncommon butterfly. And these guys really like to uh, forage and lay their eggs on false foxglove. So this flower, this tube-like flower, Agalinus, uh, one of my favorites in the piney woods. And I love this photograph that Walter captured of the eggs laid on the bud of the false foxglove. So here's the eggs right here of the buckeye. And then here's the caterpillar. So we haven't seen too many of these, but this is a caterpillar that's definitely using a defensive strategy of having armature, so spines that are difficult to swallow. And in this case, um, these, these caterpillars would not sting you. So if you touched this, it's actually not as dangerous to you as it looks. Um, there's actually butterfly caterpillars are not uh, stingers by and large. So uh, you don't need to worry about them. Um, and you can see that the chrysalis that's been built here, again, is another one of the um, wood slash poopy mimics. I also want to point out that this is one that Walter cultivated so that he would be able to take the photograph. So this kind of gooey looking stuff at the top of the picture, that's just um, hot glue, you know? He just would apply it to a stick with a hot glue gun and then he'd be able to document, he was able to document the life stages. So here's the buckeye emerged. Um, this one's referred to as a sleepy orange. These guys really like uh, the sennas, so the plants like often referred to as candle bush, and, um, and kind of like the cassias, you know, the sulfurs like the cassias. So here you can see the little tiny eggs. I mean, they're just really diminutive, little teeny tiny uh, specks, not something you would easily notice. And then here is the caterpillar of the orange, and he's actually chowing down on what looks to be a bud of the flower of that candle bush. And then this is another uh, relative here. This is the cloudless sulfur. These guys are pretty common in New Orleans. Uh, here's the caterpillar and nice shot of the J stage. So here's that caterpillar getting ready to go into its chrysalis and hanging from its little hammock, getting all comfy as it begins to um, prepare its uh, pupil stage. And here it is doing some incredible leaf mimicry, even kind of looking like a rolled leaf in the same manner of the leaves around it. Really quite amazing. And what a proboscis. <laughs> Very cool feeding on this vervain. This is another phenomenon that you all may have observed before called puddling and it gets back at that sort of phenomenon that occurred in my truck where the butterflies were licking, you know, sweat uh, salt minerals. So uh, you may see butterflies doing this on the ground and they're kind of, they're licking minerals off the mud and just supplementing their diet this way. Um, this is a butterfly that uh, has a fun name. So this is referred to as a question mark. Pay attention to how brightly colored it is on its upper wings here. Um, the caterpillar is really kind of unfriendly looking, <laughs> very spiny. The chrysalis is uh, well camouflaged to be stick-like. And uh, here's another example. You can see Walter was using some uh, hot glue here to capture this chrysalis. And then here again is the question mark. This was, uh, we were out doing a butterfly count. I was doing a butterfly count with Linda Ald and the question mark had landed on her bag and I got this photograph, which was just <laughs> so beautiful. The butterfly was so bright, but its underwing is actually uh, a lot less brightly patterned and it's so named the question mark because of this little silvery pattern that looks like a question mark. There is another butterfly called a comma 
and the comma uh, looks similar to this, but it's missing the little point there. So uh, its punctuation is different and it is not nearly as inquisitive, apparently. All right, here's uh, another species called the goatweed leaf wing, very bright on the upper sides and much duller on the undersides. Uh, as you can see here. So really uh, quite incredible the way they will mimic a dead leaf. So they'll fold their wings and they almost like disappear and then they open them and it's like this flash of brightness, a uh, common habit of butterflies. Here are the eggs laid, these round eggs on this very furry goatweed leaf. Here is the caterpillar, warty looking guy, <laughs> really big head like the skippers have. And their strategy is to actually curl up in the leaf. And there are a lot of caterpillars that do this. So there's certain caterpillars that spend the daytime curled up, protected in the leaf, and then they actually feed it at night. So uh, there's a few that I've shown you that do that. Even the uh, that Eastern Tiger Swallowtail caterpillars will do that as well. So neat little strategy where they stay tucked up in the goat weed and then they emerge uh, to feed later. Oh, here's another really, really incredible example of mimicry. So here is the chrysalis of that goat weed butterfly. And you can see that uh, it's got some really specific architecture to it. I don't know if it reminds you of anything, but maybe, maybe you picked up on it. It looks exactly like a green stink bug. So this is a, a, a pentatomid, and this is a, so it's one of the true bugs. It's in a completely different order, very distantly related. This is just convergent evolution here. So this is, this is an incredible example of the, the caterpillar, the chrysalis, just mimicking, um, again, what would be a noxious bug to eat so that predators leave it alone. Really amazing. Um, a few more, just a few more left, <laughs> stick with me. I know this is one that people really love. The Gulf fritillary uh, is another one that's pretty common in New Orleans. And look, y'all, who cannot love this plant? The passion vine is absolutely beautiful. It is bursting with flowers this time of year, and it is the host plant for the Gulf fritillary. In this photograph, this is an adult fritillary, a female, and she is ovipositing on a passion uh, flower vine. So she's depositing her leaves, I mean her, um, I'm sorry, her eggs on these leaves. And something interesting that I heard, I, I, I read this, it was, but I don't know that it is actually um, held up to scientific rigor, but I'm just going to put it out there as an interesting hypothesis that these plants actually have a little bit of a defense mechanism themselves where they will develop some spots on their leaves so that the butterflies when they see those spots, think that those are eggs that have already been laid and then, and thus don't lay their eggs there. That is a hypothesis about uh, the relationship between the passion flower vine and the Gulf fritillary butterfly. But, uh, but here you can see that this butterfly has no problem uh, depositing its eggs on this leaf. Here's what that egg looks like. Uh, really interesting, tiny structure, very securely cemented uh, to the surface of the leaf. And then here are the caterpillars, which I know many of you are very familiar with, uh, chewing away happily on that passion vine. In my yard, passion vine just grows bonkers. I mean, I've got several different species. It's grown all over the place. And I'm uh, really looking for some fritillaries to, <clears throat> to help me out. These caterpillars, even though they're spiny looking, this is really just the architectural defense and they are not a stinging caterpillar. This photograph is really unique because Walter was able to capture one caterpillar that it was in the in the J stage about to um, pupate and then the other that already had and it's in the chrysalis. So here's the Gulf fritillary caterpillar and here's the Gulf fritillary pupa. Here's the emerging butterfly. And actually I'm a little bit, these, the, this does not do it justice, but this butterfly is not actually white underneath the way it looks in this photograph. It's actually very silvery and uh, jewel looking in my eyes, uh, more so than it's captured in this photograph. It's a little bit, the light captured it in such a way to make it look white, but it's really not white. All right. So, uh, oh, I also did just want to mention, I'm not really doing justice to a lot of really common species uh, that are a little bit less noticed. So here in this picture, there is indeed a Gulf fritillary, but there's also a little skipper. Um, so you might notice sometimes smaller uh, butterflies or these little skippers as they're called uh, flitting around in your yard. 
they can be challenging to ID. They're pretty speciose, but I'm, I'm just pointing out that, uh, that these guys are another type of Lepidopteran uh, that's local and common. Okay, the variegated fritillary is uh, similar to that gulf fritillary with just a few little kind of coloration differences. But this is one of my favorite photographs in the whole program, because if I were to go to space in any structure, it would be in something that looks like the chrysalis of a variegated fritillary. To me, this is just the most bizarre, like out of this world, alien looking thing. And surely it should be hurdled in the form of some kind of spacecraft. This is just the best alien vehicle of all time. Uh, it's got these really beautiful kind of copper uh, protrusions on it, this kind of pearlescent coloration. I mean, this is just a masterpiece of the variegated fritillary. Another uh, butterfly that's uh, fairly common is the red admiral. And you can see interestingly how different, again, the upper wings and the under wings are. Just they can, they can show off bright color or they can fold their wings up and be instantly fairly well camouflaged. Um, this is a different species that does a different kind of camouflage. They've got these little papillae, these little kind of labial palps that, uh, that are actually believed to be, the strategy here is just to help it look like a twig. Um, so this is referred to as a snout, American snout, and uh, man, when I was working for Jennifer in the Atchafalaya, the snouts were just everywhere. These things were abundant in the summertime. Uh, they do migrate, so many of these species, well, some of these species are migratory, and the snouts are one of those, um, <clears throat> with this crazy nose that is uh, just a form of camouflage. So they can tuck that bright wing up, and then if you could visualize this, it just looks like a dead leaf and, and a twig extending another form of mimicry. This is a tiny butterfly that I love, love, love. It's called the red banded hair streak. It's got these beautiful little hair-like extensions on the hind wing and it'll sit there and it just kind of gently rubs them together. Like to me, it's like the butterfly is, you know, mulling over some ideas it's having. It, they just do this neat little wing rubbing behavior. Um, one day we had one show up in our bathroom with my daughter Ella. She's holding this red banded hair streak. You can appreciate how teeny tiny they are. You could so easily miss this butterfly and yet it is just so beautiful. Um, it's got incredible wing structure. And this is another favorite of mine. This is the uh, long-tailed skipper. These guys are really common in our, uh, in our yard. And the skippers typically have these interesting antennae that have a little bent club shape to them. That's one way you know they're a skipper. That's just characteristic of the group. Um, here is the really unique looking caterpillar. Their caterpillars tend to also have these kind of big heads that, are, um, that look a little bit dissociated from the rest of the body. And these are known as bean leaf rollers because similar to some of the other species I've shown you, they like to roll up in, uh, in the leaves as a form of protection. Oh, and, oh my gosh, I came to the end of my butterflies. That was faster than I expected. Okay, hopefully y'all are still with me. I have no idea where you are in that Zoom world, but I hope you're faring well. And I simply wanted to answer the question lastly of what to plant. So if you thought some of these were beautiful, if you've never seen them before, or if you have, but you would like to see them more, then the Clifton's always did a nice job of sharing with people what might be the best plants to attract um, wildlife to your yard, and particularly in this case, the butterflies. So I was just gonna share with you some of my favorites, although not to offend the native plant enthusiasts. I know that some of these are native plants and some of these are not native plants, but I will say that none of them that I mentioned here are um, invasive, right? So these are plants that like, like these, these verbenas, um, particularly the port, what might be called porter weed or vervain. Uh, this is a great nectaring plant and a lot of species uh, will visit, you know, bees and, and butterflies, lots of different species love these plants, but wherever you put them, it stays, right? It doesn't spread, it's not, it's not aggressive. And uh, yeah, the, the verveins are really good nectaring plants. The Clifton's also really liked um, various kinds of phlox species for their nectar. So you're taking care of the adults. Um, one of my big favorites is a native shrub called buttonbush. If you have a really wet spot in your yard, uh, then that is a great place to plant buttonbush. Uh, they are hydrophilic, which means they love the water, and they'd be perfectly happy in uh, helping you soak, soak up some of that uh, soggy bottom in your yard. 
And then uh, ironweed is another one that, that grows well and is popular for uh, the nectaring insects and, is, and also pentis. Although pentis is a little bit tricky because um, there can be some <clears throat> varieties sold in stores like Home Depot and Lowe's. I would just caution you to be really careful about plants that have neonicotinoids. There is legislation now that says that, uh, that any plant that's been treated with this chemical needs to be labeled as such, and you should avoid those plants. Uh, they're very, they're, they're toxic to insects, they cause disorientation in honeybees, they cause neurological problems, and, um, and really you don't want to be buying those plants and introducing them to your garden. So avoid those neonicotinoids. And there are some uh, cultivated pentis species that apparently are not nearly as uh, nectariferous as others. So uh, pentis might be one that you get from a place that's more um, specialized in the, in the nectaring plants that they're growing. Cat's whiskers is another really beautiful one that's a great butterfly plant, as well as my particular favorite are the salvias <clears throat> and lobelias. So these are genera that are very speciose, many, many different kinds. They're, they're hardy, they can flower in heat. Um, some of them can persist into the winter. A lot of them come back year after year. So uh, they're perennial, you know, you just, you cut them back and then they'll, they'll grow again. Uh, so I really love the salvias and lobelias for their nectaring properties, for their color, for the beautiful flowers they produce and for their longevity. Um, another interesting group are the asters. Uh, there's so many millions of asters out there, but another great uh, nectaring plant, and particularly the Clifton's yard was absolutely full of tithonia, and uh, the, the butterflies loved it. So this was one of their favorites. Uh, we have an aster that grows on the North Shore called Stochesia. It's really beautiful. It's low growing. It's a native plant and another uh, good nectaring plant. And then I know this doesn't look like your typical aster, but this is Another kind, it's called Liatris, and this one grows out in the piney woods. Um, and then there's also things like thistles, you know, something that comes up that you might consider a weed, you might also consider leaving because it could be a uh, good forage for butterflies. Marigolds are another one that uh, may offer a little bit of natural pest control to your yard and also has some nectaring properties. But really, a lot of times anything wild will do. Um, I realize that many people do not like to grow goldenrod in their yards because uh, you can have such strong allergies to it. But man, the insects love it. And um, is it Abacanthus or Ageron? <laughs> And then uh, the Azuratum is another one that's very popular uh, with insects and grows really well and robustly and pretty wild, uh, at least in my yard. So I wish you all happy gardening. I hope that you are up to the challenge of creating uh, spaces for wildlife and particularly these incredibly beautiful butterflies that we host here in Louisiana. And, uh, and I hope that you've enjoyed this program. And if you have any questions, I'm going to open it up to you guys. Thank you.